this day in 2006, two Israeli soldiers were kidnapped. Eight others were killed over a span of just a few hours. Three of them in an initial attack on the Lebanese border, five more in the events to come. Simultaneously, Hezbollah launched Katyushas at Israeli border communities, marking the beginning of the second Lebanon war. 44 Israeli civilians lost their lives, along with 121 Israeli soldiers. On the Lebanese side, 1,100 people were killed, along with between 500 to 800 Hezbollah fighters. We're here on Mount Adil in Israel's north. Behind us, you can see Israeli landscape reaching all the way to southern Lebanon. This is where Israel decided to pay tribute to the soldiers who lost their lives. Today, we take a look at the past, the present, and what may come as Israel marks 10 years since a bloody war that for the first time spilled further into Israeli territory. I-24 News senior defense correspondent Shai ben -Ari takes a look back at the war that was from the Israeli perspective. The Israeli narrative concerning what is known as the Second Lebanon War is a complex one. For many in the country, the 34-day conflict in the summer of 2006 conjures up bitter memories of heavy casualties, unachieved objectives, and Hezbollah rockets which slammed into Israeli towns from start to finish. On the other hand, the war has been followed by 10 years of quiet on the northern border, and some now see the conflict as one of the most justified in Israel's history. Amir Peretz was Israel's defense minister 10 years ago. Before the war, he was associated more with working-class activism than the military. He had only been in the job for about two months when a Hezbollah cross-border ambush triggered Israel's first war in decades. During a meeting, we received reports of an incident in the north, with two soldiers abducted and three other soldiers hit. After the cabinet meeting in the evening, it was clear that we were moving forward with full force to war. There were problems from the get-go. Retired Major General Moshe Kaplinsky was the IDF's Deputy Chief of Staff during the war. The Army suggested objectives, the Cabinet approved them in principle, adding some changes, including the clause of bringing back the hostages, which was not a military mission as we defined. I believe this was one of the most well-organized wars we've had. There's no question at all. The order of decision-making and the cooperation between all factors was profound. We weren't able to set clear, measurable objectives that were attainable within a reasonable time frame. And I think that was part of the confusion and lack of focus that accompanied us in the 34 days of war that followed. In the early stages of the war, the Israeli military focused its efforts on aerial and artillery bombardments. But Hezbollah militants were able to continue firing rockets into Israel throughout. Many of these rockets were fired from residential areas. You have a house with a living room, kitchen, bedroom and a missile. It was Peretz who on July 13th ordered the destruction of most of Hezbollah's mid-range missiles, which were capable of hitting central Israel. Later, Israeli jets struck civilian infrastructure in Beirut, including the Dachya neighborhood. But as the war stretched on, there seemed to be no end in sight. Even if you have a large bank of targets, after several days it looks like you're doing the same thing all the time. July 30th was a turning point. The point at which the combined political and military effort got stuck was an unpredictable incident known as the Kana village incident. 28 people were killed, including 16 children, when Israeli airstrikes hit a building in the village of Kana, which was thought to be hiding Hezbollah militants. Though the IDF expressed regret, from this point on, Israel was put under intense international pressure to bring the war to a close. In the meantime, preparations intensified for a major ground incursion into Lebanon, amid growing talk of rifts between senior officers on the northern front. On August 8th, Moshe Komplinsky was named the Chief of Staff's representative and sent to the Northern Command to assist in coordination, a move some interpreted as a lack of faith in Major General Udi Adam, the head of Northern Command. The media's interpretation was mistaken. I don't think the Chief of Staff should have announced it. As Israeli troops massed on the Lebanese border, diplomats at the UN were trying to reach a formula that would enable a ceasefire. We received notice from our negotiation team that in fact a French proposal was now on the table that was very harsh in terms of the Israeli point of view, including an immediate ceasefire, without requirements for what was to come after, without a commitment for the amounts of peacekeeping troops. 
With Israel facing an unsatisfactory UN decision, the go-ahead was given for a major ground operation, and Israeli soldiers were soon locked in intense and difficult fighting in Lebanese villages. 33 Israeli soldiers and some 80 Hezbollah militants were killed in these last three days of combat. Many of the soldiers who took part had not been drilled for such situations. We had battalion commanders who were commanding a battalion of tanks for the first time. They had never done it before. We knew this. Despite the difficulties, Peretz links the ground incursion to a major diplomatic upturn for Israel. A proposal was immediately put forth. Within a few hours, the Security Council convened and approved it and the approved proposal realized all of Israel's demands. The UN decision called for the removal of Hezbollah's armed forces from southern Lebanon, as well as the deployment of both the Lebanese army and UN peacekeeping forces in the area. A ceasefire was agreed on August 14th. I say today, I believe there is no glory in war. A war against terrorism can only be assessed in terms of how deterred the other side is. In terms of coordinating and defining objectives and making the decision to go to war, as opposed to being dragged into war, I don't think we've applied the lesson. While the past 10 years have been among the quietest along the northern border in Israel's history, the assumption of the Israeli security establishment is that another major conflict with Hezbollah is a matter of time. Two years after the end of the war, the bodies of the two kidnapped soldiers, Ehud Goldwasser and Eldad Regev, were finally returned home to their families. But as they waited, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, they had no idea in what conditions they would be returned. I-24 News reporter Laura Duhamel sat down with the families to talk about the boys and the two very long years between the kidnapping and when they were eventually laid to rest. It was 10 years ago, the morning of July 12, 2006. A group of Hezbollah members crossed the Israeli border and targeted an IDF patrol. They killed three soldiers and fled, but not before snatching two wounded soldiers, Eldad Ragev and Uri Goldwasser. This sparked the beginning of what has been called since then the Second Lebanon War. Udi's mother, Mickey, was in South Africa when she heard the news. I told my husband at the very moment we landed that nothing mattered to me. I was going to fight. I didn't know how, with what, or if we were going to have to fight because we thought that the war would end and that the two countries would exchange their prisoners. Only one thing was clear to me. My son was not going to be a second Ron Arad. Ron Arad is still an open wound in Israel. Captured by a Lebanese Muslim group in 1986 after his plane was shot down, his ultimate fate remains unknown. For Udi and Eldad's families, the only way to make sure that their sons wouldn't be forgotten was to get the government's attention and that of the media. You were really determined. Where did you find the strength? Look at nature. Each mother protects her offspring to the best of her abilities. On July the 16th, 2008, two years after their kidnapping, Israel struck a deal with Lebanon. The release of five terrorists in exchange for the two soldiers. That morning, the families of the two soldiers still had hopes of seeing them alive. That morning, we were at home, sitting in front of the television, to see the kids coming back. And then we saw the Lebanese official bring down the first coffin. They did it in the most terrible and dishonoring way. They grabbed the coffin and threw it on the ground. We switched off the television. Later, we learned that they had brought the second coffin too. But by then, we had already understood that they were both dead. Samir al-Kuntar was one of the terrorists released to Hezbollah that day. The man had brutally murdered a four-year-old Israeli girl and her father in 1979. In Lebanon, Kuntar received a hero's welcome. This release and the images of celebrations in Lebanon caused a national trauma. If the country had managed to dissuade the enemy from attacking us, they wouldn't have been kidnapped. If their dissuasion technique isn't good enough, the country has to take responsibility. 
It sent them there. It must bring them back. Yet it is up to the families if the country has to do everything possible to bring back the corpses. Had I been sure Udi was already dead, I would have never agreed to release Samir Kuntar. And after the long, hopeful wait came the hurt and the mourning. Udi, all the eyes are on me now. They're expecting me to cry, but I won't cry here. Not now. I am standing here in front of you to talk to my people. Stand up straight. Don't look down and be a proud nation. He's always with me, always. Those I spend with my children first, and with my grandchildren too. Sometimes I don't feel good. They live in the same building I do, on the ground floor, so I go get a Valium. Life goes on. I told you, I have black holes inside me, but life goes on. Today, the war still haunts many who served, and not only those who saw action. Bereavement units knocked on 121 doors, telling parents their sons will never return home. Soldiers are troubled by nightmares of war, seeing faces of friends they lost. Julian Balul sat down with two former IDF soldiers to talk about the war itself and how they've attempted to cope after. Root and Shlomi were both serving in the army when Israel's second Lebanon war broke out in July 2006. Shlomi was sent with other soldiers to the front line to fight Hezbollah, and Root stayed behind to take care of the bereaved families. I got a 24-hour pass to go home several days after the ground troops had entered Lebanese territory. I barely had time to get to Tel Aviv when I got a phone call telling me that soldiers in my unit had been killed. I gathered my soldiers about 20 minutes before getting on the bus to Lebanon. I asked them if anyone wanted to talk. Most of them remained quiet. So I told them that this unit was a brotherhood and that we were all responsible for each other's lives. When I got to the base in the middle of the night, I saw dozens of young soldiers training for the ceremony. The projectors were lit up and soldiers were crying everywhere around me. I was alone and I didn't know yet who had been killed. The next day, we all took the bus to go to Benji's funeral. I was standing in front of the grave. Next to me was his widow and his coffin covered with an Israeli flag. They had been married for only two weeks. People were crying and screaming. I wanted to cry so badly, but I didn't have the right to. I was part of the army, not just a civilian. I never forgot those images. Shlomi and the men in his unit stayed three weeks in Lebanon. They fought battles such as the Battle of Saluki, during which 33 Israeli soldiers were killed in only a few hours. It lasted three days, and yet I remember everything, every hour and every detail of that battle. It is impossible to forget. It's always in my head. Not a day goes by that I don't think about it. And all of those who fought with me think about it every day, too. Two of the soldiers in my unit even committed suicide after the war. If the war scarred Root and Shlomi for life, getting back to normal civilian routine was also extremely difficult. I was the last soldier in my unit to leave Lebanon. After crossing the border back to Israel, I saw my soldiers dropping their gear on the ground, breaking down and just crying. And to think about it today, at that moment I was crying too. After the war, I decided to flee the country, to go as far away as possible. I went to Asia. I didn't want to be in Israel anymore. Hearing in your earpiece people you know screaming because they got injured, seeing their corpses, the explosions, the tanks on fire, these images haunted me. In the end, I understood that wherever I would go, wherever I would flee, I would always be part of this country, of this land, and that I belong to this people. So I came back. Who said a hero didn't have feelings? I think a hero knows to say, I fought a war, it scared me, but I want to stay and live here anyway, and I am ready to talk about it. Today, both Root and Shlomi are part of Resisim, 
an organization that encourages those who are affected by the war to talk. In spite of the trauma, both of them, like their comrades, agree on one thing at least. If a new war were to break out, they would all be ready to wear the IDF uniform once again. We are going out for a short break for more of today's top stories. But when we get back on a special broadcast of the second Lebanon war, we take an in-depth look at Hezbollah and the border today. Thank you for staying with us on this I-24 News Second Lebanon War Special. Hezbollah has faced many difficulties and challenges over the last 10 years, including losing many of its fighters in the ongoing war in neighboring Syria. But the militant group is alive and well, and its allies are sticking by it through thick and thin. Meanwhile, the political vacuum in Lebanon has given the group more power. I-24 News correspondent Mohamed al Qasim takes a look at the militant group back in 2006 and how they've advanced militarily until today. The Israeli-Lebanese border may be quiet now, but 10 years ago, war raged. The Second Lebanon War was triggered when Hezbollah captured two Israeli soldiers, leading the Israeli army to cross into Lebanon to search for them. A month later, massive destruction to Lebanese infrastructure, devastation to the lives of thousands of the country's citizens followed. There were casualties on both sides, more than 1,100 Lebanese and 159 Israelis killed in the fighting. At the time, the Shia armed group, who has an influential political arm in Lebanon, enjoyed widespread support in the Arab world. It was seen as the only entity willing and strong enough to challenge Israel. This did not sit well with many Arab governments. The Saudi leadership saw the group's actions as wild and out of control. Furthermore, endangering the stability of Lebanon and the region. Hezbollah's popularity with the Arab street has diminished greatly since 2006. In fact, the Arab League came out against Hezbollah earlier this year. The resolution of the League's Council of Foreign Ministers includes the designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist group. In the years since the war, Hezbollah joined Iran in the ongoing war in Syria the two siding with embattled Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, a move that further angered Arab Gulf states who see Iran as a threat to their national security. But despite heavy losses in Syria, many Hezbollah leaders view the group's involvement there as preparation for the next war against Israel. Hezbollah has changed for the better and has turned into a regional power in politics and military sense. World powers negotiate with Hezbollah and worry about what the party plans for. It is now an offensive force, not a defensive one, and the fighting in Syria has given its fighters considerable experience. Today, Hezbollah's arsenal has been upgraded substantially. Just last April, Israeli Deputy Chief of Staff Major General Yair Golan said the Lebanese armed group has more than 100,000 rockets and missiles pointed at Israel, adding that any further war with Hezbollah will be devastating and much harsher than anything experienced in the last 20 years, forcing Israel to unleash all of its military might. In a speech, Hezbollah's charismatic leader Hassan Nasrallah threatened to invade Israel if it attacks Lebanon. I say to the Mujahideen of the Islamic resistance, be prepared for a day if war is imposed on Lebanon. The resistance leadership may ask you to take control of the Galilee. In addition, it is believed that Hezbollah has successfully acquired missiles from Syria and Iran capable of reaching as far as the coastal city of Tel Aviv. Moreover, the group is relentlessly building dozens of training camps and military facilities across the Bekaa Valley and southern Lebanon. 
Hezbollah is not only thinking about the next face-off, but it is preparing for the next battle, a battle that will change the region's landmarks, a battle for the blood of the martyr Imad Muganye, the battle to liberate the Galilee. But aside from rhetoric, the militant group has kept its actions at bay. And with three incidents in the last couple of years, may be evidence that neither side is interested in any armed conflict anytime soon. Just as Hezbollah changed over the last decade as an organization, so have their finances. And as they continue losing soldiers in the battle in Syria, they're losing money as well. Now, funds that they originally used for military hardware is being dispersed elsewhere, and they are relying heavily on other sources to funnel money into the organization. Defense correspondent Anna Ehrenheim takes an in-depth look at Hezbollah's current financial situation. It's one of the most prominent terror organizations in the world, but Hezbollah is said to be in its worst financial shape in decades. The finances of the Lebanese Shiite militant group, designated as a foreign terrorist organization by dozens of countries across the globe, has been hit hard, due in large part to years of sanctions by the United States, but also because Hezbollah has become bogged down fighting in Syria for President Bashar al-Assad. The United States recently passed the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Act, threatening sanctions against anyone who finances the group in any significant way. Lebanon's central bank governor, Riyad Salameh, has said that Lebanon is obliged to abide by that law, which is reported to have angered the militant group. In May, Gulf Arab states led by Saudi Arabia also blacklisted Hezbollah, halting a $3 billion military aid program to Lebanon, saying that the terror organization had, quote, a stranglehold on the state. But the designation does not affect Hezbollah's patron Iran, which continues to provide financial and military support, according to some estimates to the tune of at least $200 million a year. With that, Hezbollah has more than rebuilt its military capabilities in Lebanon since the last war with Israel in 2006, with advanced military hardware able to penetrate deep into Israeli territory. Well, they're going to constantly focus on the state of Israel. Again, it's, it's another main goal, not just for Hezbollah, but also for uh, Khamenei and for uh, the people who are running Iran right now. But Iran is not the sole provider, as Hezbollah receives significant financial aid by supporters who live abroad, as well as through charities and a wide variety of criminal activity, such as fraud, the drug, arms, and blood diamond trade. This network of criminal and narcotic rings are not based in Lebanon, but are a global network based primarily out of Africa as well as North and South America. Hezbollah operatives also rely on legitimate business enterprises that in truth are shell companies which raise, launder and transfer large sums of money to the group. They have their hands in just about every single pot that they can. And I think a key to their survival is really diversifying uh, how they can get funds into the organization just in case there's a problem, just in case something is cut off because they're, again, I mean, they're in this for the long haul. And, and while many of the funding, without a doubt, pays for Hezbollah's military and terror operations, Hezbollah is also deeply embedded into Lebanese society, with thousands of Lebanese Shia relying on them for social, medical and financial support. So is Hezbollah deeply entrenched into Lebanese society? As a political, social, and military organization, it is important to remember that the group is primarily a jihadist organization, which will continue to find both illegal and creative ways to fund its terror. During the war itself, it's many of the border communities that were hit with daily Katyusha's attacks, like the one we are in right now, called Kfar Vradim, and they extended further into Israeli territory as well. We're joined now by the mayor of Kfar Vradim and the head of the Northern Regional Confrontation Line Forum, Mr. Sivan Yechieli. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Mr. Yechieli, first of all, can you describe the scene back in 2006, what it was like to be in this village at the time? Well, we got a, a pre-warning, a very uh, short uh, warning that uh, something's going to happen. And thereafter, all hell broke loose. Uh, we started he hearing sirens. Uh, most of the times, the missiles came before the sirens. And sometimes there was no sirens, but there were a lot of missiles. And you heard uh, falling from all around. Now, it was nothing nearly as what we expect to happen, but uh, there were many missiles around. 
people were inside the, uh, the bomb shelters or their uh, uh, protected rooms. And uh, a lot of people uh, left and uh, went to the center of Israel where it was uh, quiet. Quieter and safer. And now in 2016, is there a fear among the people who live not only in Kfar Vladim but in the entire northern area that something may happen again soon? Well, I, I wouldn't describe it as fear. The, I, would, I would say more awareness. We are very well aware that uh, over the border, not far from here, there are a lot of people that are not uh, seeking our... Uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, Zionists. And uh, we expect that sometimes this barrel of, uh, of uh, explosive will, will explode. The question will be, how will it happen and when will it happen? And uh, it, it, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy scenario. And now you do have meetings of this Northern Confrontation Line Forum. What are the things you discuss in regards to Lebanon when you meet? We have uh, four different issues that we deal when we talk about Lebanon. First of all, we, we talk about the scenarios, the, the changes in time. So today they have uh, better ammunition. They have much heavier uh, warheads. We talk about two tons that can reach up to four kilometers, maybe, maybe even 10 kilometers. Two tons of explosive, we, we never had that. We talk about ground assault. Hezbollah has been able to uh, uh, w work with uh, battle formations in Syria. It's been doing it quite successfully. And there's no reason why it's not going to execute its plans that uh, Nasrallah has been talking about to uh, attack a, a Jewish settlement uh, along the border. So we talk about the different options. We talk about our responses. And we talk about the overall response within Israel to this kind of uh, scenario that we talk that. Uh and especially after Operation Protective Edge two summers ago, a lot of talk has come about about tunnels. Have you heard from any residents of the northern communities about noises they had heard of possible tunnels coming from Lebanon? Yes, we had a lot of discussion about tunnels, but I must emphasize tunnels are not our problem. They don't need tunnels. The Hezbollah is in Lebanon can come behind in protected areas and it can go into a, very close to the, to the fence and just cross the fence and attack. It doesn't need, it's not like in uh, Gaza when everything is, is uh, really under our control. So uh, although the people were aware of what's happening in, uh, in uh, Protective Edge and the tunnel stories, this is not our main fear. We are worried about other things. We are, most of all, we are worried that Protective Edge has, has burnt into our conscience the, the uh, idea that we can contain uh, a large amount of, of weapons. And we are talking about uh, amount of weapons the Hezbollah can fire in a day, 1,500, maybe 2,000 rockets in one day. Now that's going to saturate everything. A much larger arsenal than we saw those two years ago. It's much larger arsenal than we saw ever, ever saw. And it, not only it's much larger arsenal, it's also uh, better weapons. They're more accurate, bigger warheads, so we're talking about a different scenario. It's a scenario we can prepare for. It's a scenario we can deal with. But we have to be aware that we're not going to run. It's not a mile, it's a marathon. Mr. Sivani Khayeli, thank you very much for joining us. And as we mentioned, the border quite quiet at the moment right now. But that doesn't mean the IDF isn't preparing for any sort of conflict that may come about. Defense correspondent Shai Ben Ali spent the day patrolling the border with the IDF. Take a look. Israel's border with Lebanon is quiet these days, but it's a tense sort of quiet. IDF forces constantly patrol along the fence, which divides the two countries. And we were allowed into a restricted area to get a close-up look at the other side. UN peacekeeping forces are clearly visible, as are guard towers, which officially belong to the Lebanese military. Hezbollah does not officially have a presence here in the border region, as per the terms of a UN resolution approved following the Second Lebanon War. Unofficially, it's a different story. We see them in civilian clothing, mainly disguised as shepherds. As you know, they are forbidden to be here while armed and in uniform, so they use deception and disguise themselves as goat herders. Immediately after we spoke to the soldiers, one of these goat herders made an appearance. He may not look like a spy, but the soldiers insisted this same individual had been coming back to the exact same spot alongside the border fence for several days 
a fair distance from the nearest village. Their goal is to understand the routines, to understand what goes on here. Because of that, our routine constantly changes. There's nothing here that is always the same. It's not only shepherds. The IDF also describes social gatherings meant to disguise espionage. For example, civilian vehicles with lots of people arrive to what is supposedly a social event, and then our cameras notice that people keep talking into communication devices or pulling out binoculars or other devices such as cameras. Meanwhile, the army is busy changing the landscape itself in preparation for another round of fighting. At different positions along the Lebanese border, the IDF has been clearing away vegetation and creating these artificial cliffs that you see here behind me. The idea is to make it more difficult for Hezbollah militants who seek to cross the border and infiltrate into Israeli territory, as well as to expose them and make them more visible. Not far away, the IDF has been drilling residents of the Israeli border communities for scenarios that are likely to arise should another war break out, including evacuations. Hezbollah has said it is planning operations to capture Israeli territory in the future, and it now has more rockets and missiles than ever before. Lieutenant Colonel Yaniv Kriyaf is in charge of coordinating IDF activities with the local residents and served during the last war. The main thing that has improved is, one, the coordination, two, adjusting the expectations of the populace in terms of what they can expect. We understand the threat today. We make it clear to them and illustrate it for them as much as possible. Hezbollah is accumulating operational experience in Syria. We see what it is doing in terms of the use of firepower and the operations it is carrying out. We conclude that it will try to do that in a conflict with us, if and when one takes place. The officers stress to us that the IDF has no interest in another war with Hezbollah, adding that the same could be said for the Shiite militant group itself. That was also the situation, however, 10 years ago. Since the end of the war 10 summers ago, residents of the northern communities have been able to enjoy a peaceful quiet, but they also know that can change at a moment's notice. Well, that concludes our special show today on 10 years since the second Lebanon war. I'm Marav Severe. Thank you for watching.